my name is Diana Colby. I'm a research scientist with the Iowa Institute of Human Genetics at the University of Iowa uh, and in the bioinformatics division. Today I'm going to be discussing with you variant classification using guidelines and criteria from the ACMG. So just a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. Um, we'll start with what the published guidelines are, uh, then talk a little bit about um, what cases uh, and situations the rules are really apply, uh, geared for and applied to. Then we'll talk a little bit uh, about the resources at ClinGen, um, including the expert panels for some diseases. Um, at which point we'll switch over to going through some of the core of the classification rules uh, and discuss common pitfalls and ways that these rules sometimes get misused. And finally, we'll wrap up with uh, an application example that will hopefully demonstrate um, how and when um, to use this classification system. So starting with the published guidelines, uh, this paper from 2015 um, is freely available and really is a resource that you should definitely read um, and preferably have a copy um, close by if you need to be doing classification of genetic variants. Uh, this is a set of recommendations from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the Association for Molecular Pathology. The remainder of what we're going to talk about today really comes from ClinGen and specifically the Sequence Variant Interpretation page. So the primary guidelines were published in 2015 uh, and in the time since then, there have been a number of clarifications and expanded examples of interpretation and how best to use these rules. And so they have a number of papers which go into a lot of detail on several of the core classification uh, that were uh, set up in the initial publication. Um, and so what you have here is really an evolutionary approach to the guidelines, uh, adjustments, more details, uh, and the sequence variant interpretation group maintains this list of recommendations that build on the ACMG criteria. Uh, and this is mostly to improve consistency of use so that different labs are applying them in the same way uh, and also ensure that they're being applied in the way that was intended. So just briefly, um, genetic variants have different rules for how you might uh, interpret or classify them. Uh, and this set of rules that I'm discussing today is really designed for Mendelian disease, uh, germline or inherited variants. Uh, and specifically, we're thinking about high penetrance and generally small variants, uh, single nucleotide variants or indels um, that aren't of the size where you consider them of a copy number variation. Uh, there are separate guidelines for large deletions, and, and those guidelines are pretty similar uh, to what we'll discuss today, um, but we won't cover them in uh, any detail. Specifically not designed for really would be the area of cancer and acquired somatic mutations. So if you're thinking about a, a tumor normal study and what, what are the disease drivers there, these would not be a good set of rules to use. On the other case that um, really these, very, these rules don't apply to is the case of common risk alleles that are widespread in the population and might have a small effect on a fairly common phenotype or disease like um, diabetes risk or heart disease risk. Uh, the last caveat is that the gene must already have a well-established association with a phenotype. Um, and so if you are trying to uh, 
is uh, prove that a particular gene that you found um, variants in is responsible for a, a particular disease or phenotype that you're studying, um, but that's not been previously uh, reported on, there would be additional criteria that you would want to meet before you move into classification of individual variants. And if you don't know what your um, gene to phenotype association is, one of the things you can do is to look that up on the ClinGen website and see um, what they have in terms of whether it's been reviewed or curated. So I'm showing an example here uh, for BDP1. Um, and you can see the association that is identified is with non-syndromic deafness. Um, but it has been curated by the gene disease group to be of limited level of evidence. Uh, and so this is a case where you might want to use caution um, as there is still some question about whether this is a valid association. So like I just mentioned, ClinGen has these gene disease validity rankings from expert panels, uh, and they also have guidelines for assessing the quality of evidence that links a gene to a phenotype. Uh, and those are beyond scope for today's talk, um, but you can go to the ClinGen website and investigate those resources. And briefly, we touched on the or at least mentioned these expert panels. Um, and so the thing to know here is that the basic rules are not disease or phenotype specific. They're designed to be very generic and applicable in most to all cases. However, um, especially in uh, complex but common diseases that have um, many genes associated with them, Several disease areas have expert groups that are working with or to produce more specific or perhaps modified criteria to really tailor those rule sets to be precise for uh, different disease areas. Uh, those groups may also be uh, applying those criteria then for curation of individual reported variants. And so it's worth your time um, to determine if there's a research, if there's a group for your research area. Uh, and if so, you want to find and use their working recommendations because often they'll be more detailed uh, and they will be adjusted to reflect what's known about your disease of interest. So that is most of the uh, introductory setup material. And now we're going to move into the core classification rules. Uh, and I tend to think of these uh, in the sense of the, one of the figures that they're presented in the paper, which is a large table where the category of evidence is set up as the rows and the direction or strength of the evidence is separated into columns. And so I have a picture of that on this next slide. So you can see um, the categories include things like population data, predictive data, functional data, and inheritance data. And then the evidence can be considered in the direction of benign or in the direction of pathogenic, and it might be uh, supporting or weak evidence to moderate, strong, or in some cases, very strong evidence. And so the, at the big picture level, what you're gonna do is go through these list of criteria and collect all of them that apply to your variant. And then the final classification depends on the number and the strength of the criteria uh, that you're able to use. So we've already looked at this um, briefly, just to say the different categories um, and the strength levels from supporting to very strong. Um, these all start with a default strength level, um, but in some cases you may be able to modify the strength level to suit your um, 
information. Uh, the, one of the more common ones of those is with segregation data. Um, the baseline level is supporting level evidence, but as you increase the number of cases with segregation, with additional affected family members, the strength of that evidence can increase to moderate or strong. There's a second figure um, that's sort of the, the second piece of information that I like to always have on hand in addition to the, the big table that lists the criteria. Um, and that is the breakdown of how you can reach the various variant cl classifications. So this is the beginning of that list where to acquire a pathogenic annotation, you would need one very strong criteria and one or more strong or two or more moderate or one moderate and one supporting, etc. cetera. Um, and this is a fairly long list. I've not reproduced it in full in the slides, um, but it is uh, a figure that's useful to really just have on hand uh, for easy reference so that you can look and see, okay, I have one strong and two, me two moderate. Does that get me to um, pathogenic. In this case, it does. But if I only had one moderate and say two supporting, it wouldn't. Um, and so these are sort of very nuanced uh, categories. And so you have to be careful that you count up appropriately um, and have rated those strength levels appropriately. So in this next section of the talk, what I'm going to go through is basically uh, discuss what those core rules are, grouping them by the type of uh, category um, for the type of evidence that they represent. So the first one to discuss is population data. And so this would be your minor allele frequencies from um, public databases of human resequencing, uh, NOMAD would be the, the big one to consider right now. So if a continent level population has a frequency that's greater than 5%, um, that rule is called benign automatic, BA1, as saying that really if a variant has a frequency greater than 5%, it's really too common to be causing a rare disease. And with the asterisk that there is a very short list of known exceptions, um, and you should take a glance at that list and just, if your area includes one of those exceptions, you should know um, which ones they are. Now the next level down is where you start having to set your individual thresholds. So if the population frequency is greater than expected for the disorder, that's strong evidence that it's benign, but you do have to supply your own estimate uh, for what the frequency should be. If the on the other hand, uh, at the other end of the scale, if the variant is absent from population databases, uh, that's moderate evidence in support of pathogenicity in that it's very rare, you don't see it just in unaffected people in the population. And then um, if you have a study where you've been able to establish that that variant is more uh, prevalent in affected than it is in control, that would be strong level of evidence. Now, there are some pitfalls here. Um, PM2 is uh, one of particular concern uh, where the text of the rule actually says absent in population databases or extremely low frequency if it's a recessive disease. And one of the things to um, remember is that this guideline is qualitative and doesn't provide what the cutoffs are. And the initial guidelines were written uh, in the era when our population databases were notably smaller um, with EVS and EXAC. And complete absence, now that we have uh, databases on the size of NOMAD with 250,000 or more samples um, 
complete at, requiring complete abstinence really may be too strict. Um, so in practice, this means for recessive, you should have uh, a context appropriate carrier frequency. And then for dominant, you really need your variant to be less common than the prevalence estimate of the disease. Um, keeping in mind that with aggregation databases, of course, some of the people may be indeed affected with your condition if it wasn't an exclusion criteria from whatever study they participated in. Whenever possible, you really want to set these thresholds that you're going to use ahead of time to ensure that you're doing so consistently um, and using the same cutoffs from variant to variant. The next set of rules uh, mostly have to do with things like conservation and effect predictions. So computational scores that assess the likely impact of a variant. Um, these can go in the direction of either benign or pathogenic. Um, if the computational algorithms suggest there won't be an impact, uh, that could be BP4, so supporting level evidence of benign. If it's a missense variant in genes where to date only truncating mutations are known to cause disease, that would also support a benign classification. And then finally, silent uh, or synonymous variants um, that aren't predicted to have a splice impact would also be uh, supporting imp evidence that the variance is benign. Um, there's l fewer cases where you would really use computational tools in support of a pathogenic interpretation, and that's if the algorithms uh, suggest a deleterious effect. Uh, the caveat with that one is that the core rules um, suggest unanimous uh, assessment by your algorithms. So those are were all um, supporting level evidence. Uh, for higher levels of effect prediction, um, you can use moderate strength uh, PM5 when you have a new or different missense at a position where there's a different missense that's already known pathogenic. Uh, or if there is a length changing variant, um, and that would be an in-frame insertion or deletion or a stop mutation, um, something that does not lead to a null um, non-produced protein. Uh, the strongest levels of evidence that you can acquire, you know, based on these effect prediction tools would be either uh, strong if you have a different nucleotide change but the same amino acid change that is already known pathogenic. Uh, and then finally, um, very strong is used for those null mutations, um, specifically in cases where loss of function is known to be the mechanism of disease. Like I mentioned, the caveat with the computational predictions for PP3 um, was that they be unanimous in their assessment. Um, some ClinGen working groups relax this um, so that you might have a, a majority guidance or a, say, 60% or 75% of the tools agree um, with the pathogenic assessment. So you want to work out ahead of time what tools you're going to use. Um, and you might have a separate group of tools that you use for missense variants and splice variants that uh, have different methods of assessment. And then you have to also decide what your threshold is going to be for level of agreement. The other thing to consider, um, moving on to some of the other criteria, uh, is that you have to be a little bit careful um, with using the very strong criteria for frame shift and splice or stop gain mutations. 
you need to look at the whole protein, the whole gene level, uh, including whether it has multiple isoforms um, to assess whether in the presence of that mutation, you might still have a functional protein. So uh, I've selected a gene here that has two isoforms and if I had a frame shift or early stop mutation in this exon here, that would affect both isoforms and probably would be a null mutation. However, if my uh, mutation was in this alternatively spiced isoform, uh, this uh, alternate exon, then that mutation only affects one of these two uh, potential products and I wouldn't be able to apply the very strong criteria unless I knew that this itisoform was the one that was critical uh, in my biological system. The next category of evidence is assessing functional studies. And so if you're in a context where you are um, sequencing patients and frequently seeing novel mutations, um, in my practice often that this rule isn't available for use. However, um, if you're looking at classification of previously discussed variants uh, that might have functional studies available, um, you should definitely consider um, using this criteria. And the basic rule is you should identify good quality functional studies. And if they do show a deleterious effect, that is supporting level evidence for pathogenic. And if they show no damaging effect, that's supporting level evidence for benign interpretation. The other things that you can assess with functional studies um, or assessing the functional level of the protein is if your gene has uh, a low tolerance for missense mutation, so there's a low rate of benign missense and many pathogenic missense that supports a pathogenic interpretation. And then if the gene has been assessed such that you know about a mutational hotspot or a functional domain um, that really does not tolerate benign variation um, and your variant is located in one of those regions, then that's moderate level evidence that it may be pathogenic. Um, in terms of pitfalls for functional studies, um, you have to consider what makes a good functional study. Um, generally, you want to have something that includes more than one assay, so more than one way of it assessing the function, and that uses multiple positive and negative control variants for validating those assays um, so that you have good confidence that they really apply um, and reflect the, the true um, functional in vivo um, use of that protein. Um, sorry, a little bit at a loss for words there. Um, if this applies to you, uh, there is one of these expanded guidelines, a publication on how to use and assess uh, previously pu published functional studies. Um, the other thing to be aware of with the other guidelines is, you know, what is considered a low rate of benign missense mutations? Um, that's a qualitative guideline, not a uh, quantitative cutoff. Um, there are some recommendations in terms of how to use a gene level a metric for how constrained it is. And you want to be careful to make sure that you are using the missense constraint level versus the loss of function constraint level, um, since those are calculated separately. Um, I've shown two examples on the right here. Um, These are tables from NOMAD that they provide in terms of how many 
uh, mutations in various categories were observed in term relative to what was expected. So that O over E ratio is the observed um, relative to the expected. In this case, this top gene um, actually has more synonymous variants than are expected and somewhat less missense variants than are expected, but not um, hugely significant. It's a relatively small um, divergence from uh, a ratio of one. Um, and then when looking at loss of function mutations, um, a much more significant difference in observed over, effect, over expected. Uh, for this second gene, um, you can look at the, the same values and see that this gene really does seem to have uh, significantly more constraint on it, both the, the missense and the loss of function constraint metrics are much lower. And you can see, uh, in this case, rate at the um, orange and red levels of, of rating cutoffs. The last rules um, are listed in a couple different rows in the table, but I tend to think of the inheritance-based rules uh, together because mostly they will be uh, assessing the same kind of data about having seen uh, the variant of interest in probands, in, in affected patients, and in their family members. So if you've established that a variant is de novo, um, you can then assign either strong with PS3 or medium with PM6 uh, level of evidence that it's pathogenic. And that depends on whether you've confirmed based on other variants that you have the correct paternal and maternal samples. In a recessive disorder, if it's detected in trans with a pathogenic variant in an affected person, uh, that's moderate level PM3. Uh, as you see additional affected people, uh, probands from different families, that increases the level of strength that you can use in this uh, PM3 or PS3 type criteria. Um, in this case, uh, probands is a, a term used for the first affected person uh, identified in a particular family um, to distinguish that from siblings who are important for um, establishing segregation um, but aren't independent observations uh, statistically, given that they're close relation to the, the first affected person. You may also see some inheritance that would suggest that it's not pathogenic. For instance, if you're um, studying a dominant disease and the variant you're investigating is observed in trans with a pathogenic dominant variant, that supports a benign interpretation, as it would if you see either a recessive or a dominant variant uh, in cis with uh, another pathogenic variant. Or uh, alternatively, if the variant is found in a case where there's already an established alternate cause that seems um, more probable or already established, uh, that would support a benign interpretation for this uh, second variant. If you have more than one family member, um, you can start to establish co-segregation with disease in the affected persons, um, starting with supporting level, PP1, uh, and increasing depending on either the, the number of affected people or how distantly they're related in terms of the number of meioses that that uh, pathogenic variant would have to segregate through. If you have additional family members, but they uh, do not segregate the variant in question, um, then that would be strong evidence that the variant is benign.
there's just a few categories of other <laughs> rules that don't fit into one of these categories. Um, one in the uh, original publication of guidelines is the um, reported by a re reputable source without supporting data. Um, so that would be if there is, for instance, a, a specialty database for your disease and someone had entered a, a variant and said, we believe this is pathogenic, um, but they did not provide the, the evidence they used to establish that. Um, you can use these either benign or pathogenic criteria. This is really no longer recommended if you can avoid it. Um, the ideal case is to go back to the evidence that that other source had to classify that variant and combine that evidence with any new evidence that you may be able to add to it um, for a overall holistic classification. Uh, and then finally, um, the supporting level of pathogenic, if the patient's phenotype is highly specific for the gene. Um, and you should stress that it's not enough that the phenotype and family history, history are consistent with the gene. You really want to say the gene list uh, that I'm considering for diagnosis based on the patient's uh, clinical workup is very short. Uh, ideally, only one candidate gene or maybe a very short list of, of phenocopy genes. On a more uh, overall level, the one other common pitfall that we haven't discussed is double counting. And this is somewhat of a problem. Um, in that you don't want to use exactly the same evidence and apply it at multiple levels of different criteria. So for instance, if you know that a variant is loss of function, uh, PVS1, you can't also pick length changing or predicted deleterious because all loss of function variants um, meet those criteria and you want to just use the strongest level uh, that applies. In general, you want to pick one item per row. Um, there are maybe some exceptions to that guideline, um, but you'd want to be using caution and making sure that you're not double counting um, if you find yourself simultaneously using um, multiple criteria that are in the same row. And so let's go back to this um, other list that we uh, displayed right at the beginning. Um, and that is the assessment of how then do you get to a pathogenic classification for a variant. Um, you can see um, there's lots of ways, but in general, they require multiple uh, criteria to be met. In many cases, um, four or more uh, different criteria have to be established. And you may have noticed there aren't that many criteria to start with. Um, and if we're being strict and making sure we don't double count, it's actually pretty hard um, to meet these criteria for pathogenic classification, at least, uh, without a pretty large body of evidence regarding the variant. Um, so I'm gonna go through uh, a classification example here that hopefully will illustrate some of these points more effectively. So in this case, we had a patient present in clinic with osteopenia, which is a loss of uh, calcium in the bones, uh, rickets, which also um, a bone disorder of softness um, and not enough bone strength, and renal tubular acidosis, so a kidney phenotype and pain, and negative family history. So on sequencing for a kidney disease panel, uh, we identified two variants in the gene ATP6V0A4. Um, one of them is an indel uh, frameshift mutation, so a deletion of four nucleotides, 
and the second one was a missense mutation. And in this case, we didn't have parental samples available to establish the phase of those two variants. Now, in terms of the gene, uh, ATP6B0A4 is known to be the cause of distal renal tubular acidosis type 3, with or without hearing loss. Um, and some of the clinical features of that diagnosis include uh, metabolic acidosis, usually uh, accompanied with these kidney phenotypes, nephrocalcinosis or nephrocytosis, um, but also hypokalemia, uh, low potassium and normal, normal serum calcium and phosphate, although uh, osteomalacia or rickets may uh, occur in untreated cases. Um, so here we have renal tubular acidosis and rickets um, with some indication of um, other um, salt and ion uh, concentration levels uh, that are problematic in this patient. So we feel that that's a good match for the gene to phenotype correlation. Uh, and then we can look at our two variants of interest. The first one, maybe a little bit easier to deal with, is this uh, frame shift deletion. Uh, the gene does have multiple isoforms, but this axon is included in all of them, and it's not at the 3' end, so we do expect uh, nonsense-mediated decay to be in effect. This would be a null mutation um, and can be classified as using the PVS1 rule. Uh, this variant has been seen in Nomad, uh, but the frequency is quite low, 0.0075%. We feel that's low enough in this recessive disorder to qualify for PM2. Uh, so, so far we have one very strong and one moderate, um, and together those would give us a likely pathogenic interpretation. Um, to get up to a definitively pathogenic interpretation, we would need to have one more strong, moderate, or supporting piece of evidence that we don't have right now. So let's move on to the second variant, which is this missense mutation. So the filtering threat, um, the filtering level, uh, sorry, the minor allele frequency uh, to use for a filtering threshold in Nomad is 0.027%. So it is more common, um, but still sufficiently rare uh, for recessive inheritance in this case. Um, so that this variant also qualifies for PM2. Um, it is predicted to be a damaging missense substitution by SIFT, Polyfen, and some other tools. So we'll use PP3 supporting level. And there are only three genes that are known to cause distal renal tubular acidosis. And we eliminated proximal renal tubular acidosis uh, by a urine chemistry test from the health provider. Um, and so we can use the PP4 criteria, which is that the um, phenotype is very specific to this gene. So at this point, we have one moderate and two supporting criteria, and that is only um, allows us the variant of unknown significance um, interpretation. It's just not enough evidence um, based on these three uh, pieces of information. Um, fortunately, uh, going into ClinVar and into the literature, um, this variant has been previously reported as pathogenic or likely pathogenic in ClinVar. And so what we want to do is not just say previously reported pathogenic, but really go back to those papers and see if we can uh, establish what the level of evidence is. Uh, so a first paper in 2015 had two SIBs with a DRTA phenotype, and they were homozygous for this missense, and the parents were het as expected. In 2016, a second paper had two unrelated patients with DRTA who were homozygous. One patient who was compound het with a different previously reported mutation, um, and in that case, segregation was confirmed. Uh, 
And then finally, one patient with missense and a stop gain mutation, um, but segregation was unavailable in that case. Um, so if we combine all this data um, between the two papers, they saw three homozygous probands, uh, so three families with homozygous cases, and one family with a compound head case. Um, so based on recessive inheritance, we can say that's the PM3 type criteria, but at a strong level of evidence. And then the number of probands in total um, that have this variant, we've seen this now including our patient in six unrelated probands. Um, and that seems more likely um, than we would see it uh, in the background population, although this really isn't a statistical test of enrichment. So we might use PS4, but we might also downgrade that uh, to a moderate instead of a strong level of evidence. Um, then finally, we have in one of these families from the 2015 paper, we have segregation in an affected sibling. Uh, so that is PP1. So between what we had before and what we've added based on the literature, we have one strong, two moderate, and three supporting pieces of evidence, uh, which is enough to qualify for a pathogenic interpretation. Now, if we go back to our deletion mutation, previously we had one very strong and one moderate for likely pathogenic. But now that we know that the missense is pathogenic, in this patient, uh, in our case, we see the deletion mutation in a proband with a known variant. We don't know the phase, um, but we can consider that this supports um, a pathogenic interpretation um, based on the PM3 criteria, even though we don't know the phase of these two variants. Um, and so based on adding that one a supporting level piece of evidence, then we can also consider the deletion mutation to be pathogenic. Um, ideally, we would be able to test the parents and use uh, the PM3 at the moderate level, but uh, in practice, that's not always available. So resources uh, for this presentation, uh, I really recommend going to the ClinVar, uh, sorry, the ClinGen, um, web page and looking through the sequence variant interpretations groups resources. Nearly all of today's material was pulled from there. Um, there are a lot of papers, in, published papers and, and technical white papers to discuss how to apply these criteria in addition to a wealth of data uh, about curation efforts that have already been completed. Um, and so uh, thank you for watching this video, and I hope that um, you've enjoyed or at least found useful this content um, from the University of Iowa. Thank you.